My name is Connie Vanderakis. I'm a middle-aged white woman um, with long gray hair, which is tied up in a knot in the back of my hair. I'm wearing glasses, red and blue glass earrings, my disability pride virtual PA shirt, and I have a spiral staircase in the back of, uh, in my background. Um, today we have a very special speaker, Jamie uh, Ray Leonati is here to be with us today to share. She is the Associate Director of Policy, uh, uh, Director of Policy on, at the Institute on Disability at Temple University. I'm now going to turn it over to Jamie and if everyone could turn their cameras off and their mics, that would be most helpful. Thank you. Jamie. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Connie, for that introduction. I'm just going to pull my presentation up here. All right. Is everybody able to see the presentation on my screen? Yes. Great. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here as part of Disability Pride uh, 2021, uh, hoping that next year we can all be back together in person. But for now, this virtual format uh, will do. Um, for those of you who may not uh, know me, I'm Jamie Ray Leonetti, as Connie said. Uh, I do work at the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University as the Associate Director of Policy. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I too am a middle-aged white woman uh, with short brown hair and glasses. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about the Home and Community-Based Services Final Rule or the HCBS final rule. You might also hear this sometimes called the HCBS settings rule. It's all the same. Um, before we get into that, just a little bit about where I work. The Institute on Disabilities at Temple University is Pennsylvania's University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, Education, Research, and Service, or what we sometimes refer to as a USED for short. Uh, we have the distinction of being the only USED in Pennsylvania. Some states have more than one, Pennsylvania just has one and we have statewide responsibility. So while we're physically located on Temple's campus in North Philly, um, we have staff that reaches all the way out to Pittsburgh and beyond and we provide um, support and information and research for families and people with disabilities throughout the state. You can see here our vision and mission. Our vision is a society where all people are valued and respected and where all people have the knowledge, opportunity, and power to improve their lives and the lives of others. I take time to read that out just because I think it fits so nicely with the home and community-based services final rule and the whole idea that um, our lives as people with disabilities should be the lives that we want to live, not the life that someone else tells us we need to live or, um, you know, something that is put on us or in front of us, but the life that we create using the services and the supports that we need. Just a couple of quick acknowledgements. Um, this project is part of our HCBS final rule project funded by the Pennsylvania Developmental Disabilities Council. So in addition to thanking Disability Pride PA for having us here today, we thank the council for their support of this project. We have some project partners that include the Center for Public Representation, which is a national organization, Disability Rights Pennsylvania, which of course is our protection and advocacy agency here in Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh Center for Autistic Advocacy, and Self Advocates United as One, or SAU One. Um, if there's anybody on the uh, line today from um, 
Self Advocates United is one. You may recognize some of your colleagues in a couple of these slides. Uh, we also want to thank our sister agency, the Bog Center on Developmental Disabilities, for sharing some slides with us that we use in this presentation. So what is the HCBS final rule? I would guess that many of you have probably heard of it by now, um, but this is a federal rule that was announced by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or what we call CMS, way back in January of 2014. So you might be asking yourself, well, why in the world are we talking about a rule that was introduced you know, more than six years ago now? Well, we're talking about it because it still has not been fully implemented. Uh, and we're also talking about it because for anybody who, you know, checks out the news from time to time, HCBS or Home and Community Based Services is a real hot button policy issue right now. Um, why is it a hot button issue? Because funding for home and community based services is now part of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, the plan that was signed by Congress and then signed by President Biden. So uh, you're going to hear me talk more about that later and uh, the role of HCBS in the American Rescue Plan and how you can have an impact on how Pennsylvania spends its home and community-based services dollars. So the Home and Community-Based Services final rule that was introduced by um, CMS back in 2014, it impacts both residential services and day services. So it impacts small group homes, it impacts um, adult day programs, it impacts um, supported employment settings, it impacts sheltered workshops, it impacts anywhere where home and community-based services dollars are being spent. So um, to look at it another way, home and community-based services dollars are the Medicaid dollars that fund your waiver. So if you get an intellectual disability waiver, such as person family directed supports or community living or consolidated, or you get the community health choices waiver on the Office of Long-Term Living side of things, those are all HCBS Medicaid funded dollars. So these rules that I'm gonna go over would apply to services that are provided in those settings. This rule overall is intended to promote choice of daily activities and to require person-centered planning. So again, putting the person at the center of creating their own life. Okay. Whoops, I just gotta get my slide to move forward here. There we go. All right. So. What must be done at home and community-based settings in order to comply with this rule? Well, this rule is all about integration. So in order for a setting to comply, it needs to be integrated into the larger community and give people access to the larger community. So for example, if a setting like a day program is located on the grounds of a nursing home, it most likely is not going to meet the requirements of the HCBS final rule because by being on the campus of a, a nursing home, it's segregated. It's isolating, and that's not what we want under the Home and Community-Based Services final rule. The setting needs to have plans in place to allow individuals to have their own autonomy and independence in making choices. And the setting needs to be chosen by the individual from a range of options, including non-disability specific settings. This is a big one, and it's an easy one for people to take a look at to see if the rule is being followed, um, because many, many people that we talk to, when they're asked, you know, how did you come to be living at this home, or how did you come to be using this day program, um, 
people are there because that's what was presented to them, not because they were given a wide range of choices and selected the particular setting or the particular program in many instances. And that's a concern and something that should not be happening under the HCBS final rule. So here are some things that all settings must do in order to comply with the HCBS final rule. There must be policies in place to ensure the rights to privacy, dignity, and respect for all people. There must be an opportunity for people to seek competitive employment. And I'm gonna highlight that again. This rule says that everybody, regardless of their disability, needs to be given the option to seek competitive integrated employment if they want to make that choice. It doesn't mean that everyone has to go to work. It doesn't mean that everyone has to work full time. But what it does mean is that everybody, regardless of disability, needs to be given that option. And there needs to be a discussion between you and your supports coordinator or your service coordinator, depending on your waiver, about how you feel about employment and what choices you would like to make. So if that isn't happening, you can ask your supports coordinator or your service coordinator to schedule a meeting with you and talk about that because it's required by the HCBS final rule. What are some other things that are required? Well, if you live in a residential setting, such as a small group home with three or four people in it, and some of the bedrooms are like a two-person room, so you're going to have a roommate, you need to have some choice as to who that roommate is going to be. The group home can't simply say, Jamie, you live with Sally because that's the way it is. There needs to be some discussion and some choice in that matter. There also needs to be a choice of services and who provides you with those services. So again, a group home cannot simply say, we use company ABC to provide our in-home supports or our community participation supports. So that's who you have to go with. That's not how the HCBS final rule is intended to work. The rule is intended to give people with disability choices. If you live in a residential setting and you're using your waiver dollars to pay for that, there are some additional requirements. Now, when you look at these requirements, you're probably going to say to yourself, we, we needed to have a rule and write that down somewhere. It wasn't just implied that just like any other person, regardless of whether you have a disability or not, you should have these simple things. Well, Apparently, some providers weren't catching on as quickly as we wanted them to. So yes, the federal government, CMS, felt the need to write this down. So residential settings need to provide a written lease or some type of similar written document to people with disabilities who are living in their group home. So just like I might rent my own apartment here in Philadelphia and I get a written lease that I get the opportunity to review and sign, all people get that right under this rule. People also get a right to privacy in their unit. And that includes having a door that they can lock. That applies to their bedroom door. And it also applies to the front door of the residence. So that front door needs to be accessible to the person with a disability in the way that is best for them. So for example, if we're dealing with somebody who has um, a dexterity impairment and maybe it's not easy for them to hold a key and turn it in a lock, well, then maybe the provider, the group home owner, needs to install a keypad that can be used to assist that person in being able to unlock their own front door. Because this rule recognizes that the freedom to do that and the freedom to come and go out of your own home or out of your own bedroom is fundamental to who we are as individuals. Some additional requirements, and again, you probably are thinking to yourself, well, gosh, aren't these things implied because these are things that I have at home, so why wouldn't anybody get these things? 
Well, this is part of the point. Residential settings like small group homes need to provide folks with access to food at any time. That means if I'm living in the group home and I decide at 9 p.m. that I want a snack, I should have the ability to go into the kitchen and locate a snack for myself. I also have the right to visitors at any time uh, and the right to a unit that is physically accessible to me as an individual with a disability. So if I need a railing on the steps, that needs to be provided. If I need a ramp or a barrier-free entrance to my home, that needs to be provided. We went over the choice of roommates. A uh, couple things again that I'll add here is the ability to decorate the unit just like any other leaseholder. So if I'm living in a group home with three other people, it's our decision what the unit is gonna be decorated like. It is not the decision of the staff who work at the group home. It's not the decision of the owner. It is our decision because we're the people who live there. So if we decide we wanna have a Philadelphia Phillies decor in our living room, we have that right. If I decide that I wanna put pictures of my family in my bedroom, I have that right. And lastly, and this is the one that gets talked about quite a lot, I have the ability to control my own schedule and my own daily activities. So that means that the days of uh, a provider saying, well, we only have one mode of transportation, we only have one van, so on Wednesdays we go to Walmart and on Thursdays we go to the movies, those days are over or they should be over under this rule. So if you or someone you love is still experiencing this kind of um, required group activity as part of their living experience, this does not comply with the final rule and you might wanna to talk to the service coordinator or supports coordinator about that. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to the rules that I just went over. And again, you're probably gonna find that these are somewhat common sense. Um, so a residential provider in the first example might require an individual to go ahead and close their bedroom door, but perhaps not lock the bedroom door at certain times. So for example, maybe the individual is sick, they're not feeling well. And due to the fact that there might be a medical emergency, staff is feeling like they might need to get access to the bedroom quickly. So they might say to me, Jamie, could you do us a favor? We know you want your privacy, but could you please just close the door, but not turn the lock? And that would be acceptable in that limited instance. Uh, another example would be um, what I mentioned about food or snacks. Um, yes, I have the right to get a snack at any time. But let's say that I'm someone who's just learning how to cook. And that's something that my staff is supporting me with. Maybe if staff is not available at a particular moment, I need to choose a snack that's already been prepared earlier or something that doesn't need to be cooked or maybe can be popped in the microwave. Because maybe at this point in my life, I'm not using the stove yet without assistance. Now, maybe I am and it's not an issue, but sometimes when we're learning things, um, we need to have staff support. So there's different ways to um, make sure that I get choice, but also make sure that I am safe. <clears throat> now, when we talk about exceptions, exceptions are not there for the convenience of staff or the convenience of the provider. They're there for the well being of the person. So, when we do need to make an exception, these exceptions need to be well documented and they need to be documented in a way that shows that the provider and my staff tried everything they could before we went to any type of restrictive exception. Uh, 
So that's very important. Making sure that conversations are taking place between the person with the disability who wants to live their life and um, the staff who were working directly for them. Now, this is the part of policy that is not the sexy part, if you will, but it is the important part. And that is the timelines that we're going to follow about implementing this rule. And you're going to see that we have some new deadlines. And those new deadlines are uh, primarily the result of COVID-19. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So as I said, this rule was introduced um, way back in January of 2014. And then the initial parts of this rule took effect in March of 2014. So by March of 2014, every state, because this is a federal rule, so every state, including Pennsylvania, needed to be started on the road of putting together their written state plan for how they're going to follow this rule in Pennsylvania. And then initially, there were several other deadlines for when there needed to be full compliance with this rule. There was a deadline in 2021. There was a deadline in 2022. But what you need to know now is that the new rule compliance deadline for everything to be in place is now March of 2023. And that's a new deadline um, that has been put in place because of some of the limitations posed by COVID-19. Now you're probably thinking, well, my gosh, this is a long, long time for a rule to get implemented. Why on earth are we allowing so much time? Well, so much time is allowed because the federal government recognized that this rule, even though a lot of it is common sense, as we said, is gonna be a change in the way a lot of providers think and it also might require some change in the way people with disabilities think about how they live their life and, and plan their days. Why? Because with this rule, it might be the first time ever that a person with a disability is asked, where would you like to live? Or how would you like to spend your day? And frankly, you know, if you've just never been asked that question before, it might take some time to figure it out. And this rule really wanted to recognize and appreciate that. So this is just a little bit more about the reason for the extension of the implementation deadline. Um, you know, when COVID-19 hit, there were members of Congress uh, who sent a letter uh, to CMS asking for at least a one-year extension. Um, the HCBS Advocacy Coalition, which is a, a national group that I'm part of, um, we were opposed to the extension at first because we felt like there had been enough time provided for implementation of this rule, even despite COVID-19. Um, but it pretty quickly became apparent that we weren't really going to win the, the battle on that particular issue um, because many states still had for example, in-person site visits that they needed to do to make sure that um, residential settings were compliant. And of course, we weren't able to do any of that because we were locked down with COVID. Um, so what we did say to CMS was yeah. that any extension of the time period would need to come with some interim deadlines so that we could use those as sort of guardrails to make sure that states kept moving forward on the rule. Um, and those guardrails were put in place. Okay. So in July uh, of last year, CMS issued a state Medicaid director's letter and it explained the one year extension to March of 2023 and put in place some of those guardrails. So one of the guardrails is that states during this extension period 
are to continue to work on their compliance activities and continue to work on their state transition plans. And I'm going to talk in just a little bit about the state transition plan that we have here in Pennsylvania and the status of that plan. Okay. Uh, again, some of the safeguards were to remind settings that person-centered planning needs to take place as part of this extension period, and to a reminder that um, choices of settings, even during COVID-19, need to include non-disability specific settings. So again, here are the key deadlines um, that you might want to keep in mind. Um, now, I will say that these are the current deadlines that currently exist on paper. But as you'll see here, one of them is July 1st, 2021, saying that settings that isolated are remediated or fixed by this date. Um, and if, if they're not, fixed by July 1st, 2021, then they need to submit themselves to the Center for Medicaid Services for what we call a heightened scrutiny review. Um, July 1st is right around the corner and everything points to the fact that this deadline is probably going to be extended. It has not been extended yet, but we are looking at the horizon and thinking that that's probably going to happen. So by October 31st of 2021, so that's this year, settings that isolate, so those settings that may not provide access to the larger community and have not made steps to get into compliance with the rule, they have to submit themselves to CMS for what we call a heightened scrutiny review. Heightened scrutiny review is basically just a look at the setting because the, um, the setting is saying, we think that despite where we're located, we meet the rule and we would like you to take a look at it. And then again, that new March 17th of 2023 deadline for full compliance. Whoops, make sure I didn't skip anything here. Okay, so statewide transition plans. Every state has one. So that means we have one in Pennsylvania too. We do have a statewide transition plan. It is available. You can take a look at it. You can go to Temple Institute on Disabilities website for home and community-based services and take a look at it there. You can go to www.hcbsadvocacy.org and look at it there. I'll drop those in the chat when I'm done talking. Um, but the statewide transition plan basically explains how the state of Pennsylvania is going to go about the process of following this rule. And then, as I said earlier, um, if a setting believes that it can comply with the rule, even though it might not look like it on its face, because for example, maybe it's located on the grounds of or next to a nursing facility, um, it can ask for what is called heightened scrutiny review, where it submits a packet to the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services and says, these are all the reasons why we think we do comply with the rule. Uh, and you'll see there are some links um, where you can uh, get more information about heightened scrutiny. I could probably give an hour long presentation on heightened scrutiny review, so we're not going to uh, do that today. We're definitely going to spend our time in other ways. So what are some examples of heightened scrutiny? Um, does the setting uh, appear to be presumed institutional? So for example, is that setting connected to a day program or a nursing home? Um, if yes, um, can the provider somehow show that there's community integration anyway? And what might be an example of that? Well, um, there's an argument that it's possible 
that a program could be located right next to a nursing facility or a state intellectual disability center, for example. Uh, and even though it's located right next door there, maybe the particular day program has a very robust set of services. Maybe they are set up so that they have the ability to um, go back and forth uh, with the four people who live there in their setting uh, to um, provide them with a choice of where they go during the day. Um, not everybody has to go to the same place or the same location. And if the setting is able to show that, it may be found that they comply with the rule. But that's a high bar to show that everybody is getting their own person-centered plan and their own opportunity to live their life their way. Um, so it's more than just checking some boxes on a piece of paper. So where are we now in Pennsylvania? What's going on? Well, as of now, we have initial approval of our plan and we are one of many states that only has initial approval of our plan at this point. So uh, we're not behind, we're sort of right in the middle of the pack in terms of uh, implementation and compliance with the HCBS federal rule. So uh, what happens next is that because we have our initial approval, we've gotten feedback from CMS about ways that we can improve our plan. And now Pennsylvania is in the process of making those improvements. Um, part of the way that they've made those improvements is to develop some tools. So some of you may remember that um, last spring and summer, we had two tools come out from the Office of Developmental Programs. And one was a heightened scrutiny review tool for residential settings. And another was a heightened scrutiny review tool for uh, non-residential settings. And both of these uh, tools came out for public comment. So there was a period of time, 30 days, I believe, on each one where individuals and families and organizations could comment on this tool that ODP was proposing to use to check and see if a setting was uh, isolating or, or was complying with the rule or not. So um, at the end of that public comment period, there were revisions made to the review tools and then they went out to be used. Right about the same time, unfortunately, we continued to be locked down due to COVID-19. So when I last checked in with the Office of Developmental Programs about this, which was last week, um, there are still in-person site reviews that the Office of Developmental Programs needs to make across Pennsylvania using this tool in order to make sure that settings are complying. So they are uh, telling us that they're starting to slowly get back to that process, um, but um, it's a slow roll because we wanna make sure that everybody stays safe as we come out of the pandemic. Why am I taking time to tell you all this? Because once these settings are reviewed and once changes are made to the um, plan, there's gonna be another public comment period. So that public comment period is extremely important because that's your time as an individual with a disability or a family member uh, to have your voice heard about how you think rural implementation is going in Pennsylvania. So we don't know precisely when that comment period is going to be yet, but at Temple Institute on Disabilities, we are committed to making sure that as soon as we know when that plan is out for comment again, we will blast it out on our email list, we will get it on our website, we will use social media, and we will let as many people as possible know that the time has now come to comment on the plan. But commenting on the plan and commenting on these tools, 
are not the only way that you can have an impact or an influence. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. So I mentioned before that home and community-based services is now sort of a hot issue because of the American Rescue Plan. Um, and it's a hot issue because of the American Rescue Plan because there is a lot of money dedicated to home and community-based services in that plan. And because of the money that's allotted there, each state was asked to submit a plan for how they would propose to spend the home and community-based services dollars that they would be receiving as a result of the American Rescue Plan. So back on June 14th, Pennsylvania submitted its plan. Now this is a separate plan from the state plan that I was talking about a moment ago. So I know it's confusing. We got a lot of plans. The point of all of this is that this is another opportunity for you as a self-advocate, as an individual with a disability to comment about the importance of home and community-based services. So if you go to this hot link, that gives you the ability to, to see Pennsylvania's Department of Human Services plan. One thing that I need to emphasize is that this is not just the Office of Developmental Programs plan. It's not just Office of Long-Term Living's plan. It's not just Department of Health's plan. Everybody, all of those departments had to get together and submit one large plan. So it may be that when you look at the plan, not everything in there applies to you, but I guarantee you that if you get waiver services in Pennsylvania, something in that plan is going to apply to you. So what's in the plan? What did Pennsylvania propose? So Pennsylvania came up with nine things that they wanted to spend their money on. And these are broad categories. And they came up with these nine things, not alone or in a vacuum, but they actually did get feedback from some of their partners in the disability community when they came up with this initial plan. So for example, um, the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University um, gets some funding from the Federal Developmental Disabilities Act and our state independent, um, I'm sorry, our state developmental disabilities council gets some funding under the Federal Developmental Disabilities Act, and so does our Protection and Advocacy Agency. So the three of us together gave input to the state as to how they might spend some of this money. Uh, others were consulted too, but I know we were consulted because I was part of the process. So Pennsylvania is recommending that their dollars be used to help increase access to home and community-based services. So hopefully to get some people off of our waiting list, because we know we have over 12,000 people on a waiting list for um, intellectual disability waiver services. To enhance home and community-based services provider payments, rates, and benefits. So we know that um, partly because of COVID-19, many providers are struggling struggling to keep staff, struggling to keep their operations open. So some of the dollars could be used to help with that. Um, also, and this is a biggie, to protect the health and well-being of direct care workers, direct support professionals, um, by giving them uh, additional supplies and equipment. So we know that many direct support professionals um, um, service support professionals struggled throughout this pandemic to get the PPE and other specialized equipment that they needed. So this plan would actually help with that. Even more important, perhaps, it would help with the recruitment and retention of uh, the direct support workforce. We know that, uh, you know, this is not just a Pennsylvania issue but it is a national issue that right now in this country, we are experiencing a direct support professional workforce crisis. 
And part of the reason we are experiencing that crisis is because, um, and, and this is a little bit of Jamie's opinion, but I'm going to put it out there, uh, but it's because we do not treat our direct support professionals like the professionals that they are. We need to give folks who are doing this important work a living wage, benefits, and ways to advance in their employment. Why? Because their services are essential, their services are valued, and frankly, they have families to support and lives to live too. So on the national level, we really need to step it up with our direct support workforce. So some of this money um, would be used to help in that effort. Um, also, the plan includes um, some financial support for caregivers who have had um, a lot um, placed on their shoulders as a result of this pandemic. So what else? There would be funding for some assistive technology um, to help improve uh, the lives of people with disabilities. Um, help to support transition of individuals to community-based living arrangements. So for example, we know that in Pennsylvania, there's a current plan right now to um, close two of our um, state intellectual disability centers. Um, even in the face of COVID, that plan continues to be in action and the Office of Developmental Programs continues to meet with individuals at both the Polk and the Whitehaven State Centers who are interested in transitioning into a more community-based living arrangement. So some of the dollars could be used to support those individuals in making that transition or others at other state centers or in nursing homes who are expressing the desire to live in the community. Um, some of the money could also be um, dedicated to addressing mental health and substance abuse disorder needs for people who get Medicaid waivers. And finally, um, some money could be used to help us build our capacity to continue to provide long-term services and supports. Again, that could go back to that issue of staffing and making sure that we have um, a strong direct support professional workforce, because if we don't have the trained professional staff available to keep people in the community and give us the option to live in the community, where will we end up? We will end up in a congregate setting like a nursing home or a state ID center, not where we wanna be not where we want to be living our own life the way we want to live it. But why could we potentially end up there? Because unfortunately, the way our system is set up from a long, long time ago, the congregate care setting, the isolated setting is the default system. So any of us as a person with a disability, we have an absolute right to receive care in a nursing home, to receive care in a state ID center. That's a right under Medicare, Medicaid. So why is a waiver called a waiver? Did you ever stop to think about that? A waiver is called a waiver because it's waiving the requirement that certain services and supports be provided in a congregate setting and saying, you can take those dollars that would have been spent to keep you in a congregate setting or a nursing home and get your care in the community. So get it in your own home, get it in a small group setting that complies with the rule. Um, but that's, that's a waiver. It's an exception to the standard rule. And I would argue that that's a flaw in our system but that's the way our system is currently. So our waiver dollars are extremely important because those are the dollars that allow many of us to live a community life in the way we want to live it. 
So now that you know about the rule, and now that you know about the fact that this comment period is taking place on Pennsylvania's plan for how they're going to use their HCBS dollars, now I want to call on you to take action because you all have an opportunity to take action that is going to help improve your life and the lives of others with disabilities that you know. So what's the action? Go to the hot link that was on the previous slide, check out Pennsylvania's plan, and submit your comments for how you think Pennsylvania should be spending its home and community-based services dollars that it gets under the American Rescue Plan. How do you do that? You can send your comments by email to this email address that's on my screen. It's ra secretaryoffice at pa.gov. Again, ra hyphen secretary office at pa.gov. Now, if some of you out there are thinking, oh, oh man, you know, I don't want to write my own comments. That sounds intimidating. There's an opportunity for you to. The state is going to host a live virtual public comment session on Wednesday, June 30th at 10 a.m. For those people who would prefer to provide um, feedback by speaking or are otherwise unable to submit feedback in writing. Now, we haven't gotten all of the details for that June 30th session yet, but if you're interested, I would encourage you to mark your calendar for Wednesday, June 30th at 10 a.m. and then to check back on the Institute on Disabilities website for more details about how to register for the state's comment period, because we're going to post it there as soon as we get it from ODP. <clears throat> Another important deadline to keep in mind, any comments that you want to make to Pennsylvania's plan for how they're going to use their American Rescue Plan dollars must be submitted by the close of business on July 6th. So that date is important. Another thing that I just want to throw out there, you know, the Institute on Disabilities helps people to make public comment all of the time. It's, it's something that we do and a service that we offer. So if anybody needs to make public comment or they want to make comment and they're not sure what to do, you are more than welcome to reach right out to me. Uh, my contact information will be at the end of this presentation. And I will set up a time with you to work one on one on making your comments, because this is really important. It's how you get your voice heard. So this just, of course, emphasizes that. Why are all these comment periods important? Well, they're important because this is the opportunity for people with disabilities and families to have their voice heard. And it's important because you never know when this might be the last opportunity to make your comments. Um, so whenever you see an opportunity to comment, if the issue is important to you, you are encouraged to comment in a way that's comfortable for you. Public comment, um, we know from experience, can help shape what the disability system looks like for people with disabilities in Pennsylvania. Um, and last, because of the HCBS final rule, we know that no two plans for a person with a disability should look exactly alike because no two people are exactly alike. We might have the same diagnosis, we might have the same disability on paper, but that doesn't mean that we're alike, that we like the same things, that we want to live in the same place. It doesn't mean any of that. So because of that, we want to be looking at this HCBS final rule as an opportunity to express our individuality. So this is another one of those things. Gone should be the days 
of seeing people cut and paste in individual service plans in ISPs or other documents. Uh, and yes, we know that still happens. What I'm saying to you is that this rule is a tool that you can use to call that out. So if it happens to you and you see cutting and pasting in your own ISP, you can call that out and say to your supports coordinator, hey, you know, first of all, that was never my goal in the first place. Second of all, my goal is whatever it is, because that's what's important to me. So if we look at my plan, if we look at my ISP, and then we look at my husband's plan, for example, um, our plans should look very different because, for example, it's very important for me to sing with my community choir. It is not important to my husband. Uh, he would probably rather, you know, fall over dead than sing with a community choir. But what he does like to do is go to rock concerts. So there should be something in his plan about, you know, seeing the Rolling Stones maybe the next time that they come around because you never know when it might be the last time for them. Uh, but gosh, please don't put that in my plan. And that is the whole point of this rule. So there are definitely some benefits of the rule, which I think we've talked about today. And this is just sort of a recap. If you take a few nuggets from this presentation, these are the things we would hope you would take. That the HCBS final rule focuses on activities and opportunities to be in the larger community. It is not about a place, four walls, or being in a facility. So if you don't remember anything else, uh, I would say remember this, not a place, not four walls, not a facility. Um, the rule emphasizes um, the individual and their right to live an everyday life. And it also recognizes, as we said, that no two everyday lives look alike. It requires person-centered planning and a focus on the individual. And it recognizes that our needs and our wants may be unique and different and that that needs to be addressed and respected. All this having been said, we know also that there are some challenges associated with this rule. Some of the challenge is just making sure that families and people with disabilities are informed and know that this rule even exists. You know, even though this rule has been floating around since 2014, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there's somebody on this call today who says to me that they've never heard of it before today. And you know what, rather than get upset about that, you know, because it is pretty frustrating at this point as an advocate, I'm going to say, you know what, that's okay, because now you do know about the rule and you can tell your friends about the rule. And then your friend that you pass it on to, they can pass it on to somebody else. And that's what it's all about. We as people with disabilities need to make sure that we are informed and that we're informing others. It may be challenging to ensure that day and residential programs comply with this rule. We know that. That's why CMS initially provided so much time for compliance, because we realized that um, this rule is really asking some providers to change the way they do business. And some providers have changed the way they do business. Achieva out in Western Pennsylvania is a great example of changing their business model to get people more into the community and less within the four walls of a facility. And there are others, but that one just comes to mind. And the last reason this might be challenging is something that I mentioned before. And that is we may be challenging and changing the way about some of our friends with disabilities think about how they live their life and how they spend their day. Why? Because it's possible that nobody ever asked them before, how would you like to spend your day? 
or where would you like to live? So if this is the first time you're being asked that question, it might be challenging to sort of think about that and wrap your head around it. And it might be scary to take that step and say, you know what? I, I don't want to live with these three people just because they have the same disability as me. I want to get my own apartment with supports. Maybe I want a roommate. Maybe I don't want a roommate. But that's something I want to explore and I want to take that risk. This rule allows for that. So that's pretty much all the information that I wanted to share today. I know it's a lot of information, probably a lot to digest, but I am gonna be here with you to answer questions, um, to provide more information where I can. And I hope that I will see lots of you submitting public comments on Pennsylvania's plan for how it's going to use its home and community-based services dollars from the American Rescue Plan. Uh, and even if you don't want to comment, you know, please pass it on to a friend. So with that, I will say thanks so much, and I will open it up for questions. Jamie, thank you so much. Um, you know, this is one of those uh, emojis where your head blows off, you know, um, brilliant expertise that you have. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with the content and um, delightfully overwhelmed because I learned so much um, in your presentation and wow, you are really an expert and we're, we're so happy um, to have your expertise um, in this session today. There um, are a um, few comments and questions in the chat and I thought I would start by um, just going over those. And of course, many of our participants are wondering if the, your PowerPoint will be available. So um, can you comment on that? Um, sure. Thank you, Connie. Um, as far as I'm concerned, yes, the PowerPoint can be made available. Um, I don't know, Connie, if you have a way through the registration to send that out to folks, or if you would like uh, me to have people email me if they'd like to get a copy of the PowerPoint, what, um, what's your preference? Um, I think we can link it to the event. Um, so I don't think it will be a problem and we will get that information out um, to the people because there were a lot of great links in your presentation. And um, I know that um, I can't write as quickly as people talk. And so even that PowerPoint is gonna help me um, with dates and times and um, links of, of how to connect um, to that. Um, I do wanna apologize for um, not having captions. We had a um, hiccup in um, getting captions as what uh, this happens with live events. However, um, the great thing um, about YouTube is that we will download this and have captions put on it so everyone can revisit this event and with captions and interpreters. Um, and you, you can view the um, Jamie's PowerPoint again, lots of vital information in that. So um, I wanna thank Vicki for trying to troubleshoot for us during that time. Um, there's another question. Um, one of our, participant, our participants says, is the June 30th comments just set up for ODP or IDS? Is it for all of the offices that cover HCBS? That's an excellent question, and I'm sorry I wasn't more clear about that. Yes, it's for all of the offices that include HCBS. So the plan that was submitted by Pennsylvania includes input from the Office of Developmental Programs, Intellectual Disability Services, and the Office of Mental Health and Substance Abuse, and the Office of Long-Term Living, and some other um, offices in Pennsylvania. So yes, it's, it's inclusive. Okay, great. Um, I, there's another question I'm going to ask, but I'm also going to invite our participants to um, turn on their cameras so we can all see your faces while we do the Q&A. 
Um, another participant is asking, are comments about the American Rescue Plan an appropriate place to, to ask about getting questions for support brokers for the OBRA waiver? Ah, um, I would say that um, that's probably not the best place for that, but I would encourage you if you have comments about that to um, send them to my email address and I will pass them on to the Office of Developmental Programs and the Office of Long-Term Living um, because uh, Temple actually has another grant that we're working on right now around person-directed services and that need for a supports broker would fall in there. Great, thank you. Um, if anyone has a question in uh, the group, if you would like to um, raise your hand using uh, the reaction buttons or and unmute yourself so we can hear your question. Questions and or comments. And I just dropped my email address in the chat for those who might need it. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Thank you. And while you're while folks are thinking, I'll just also mention that for for those that are interested in the supports broker and making comments about that, um, the waivers themselves are going to be coming out for a waiver renewal probably in late summer. So that would be another place where you could provide comments about supports broker. So sort of be on the lookout for that. And Jamie, is the best place um, to sign up for your newsletters to get all the dates and, and times for um, to submit comments and yeah. get up to date information? I'm just going to drop another email address here in the chat, where if you send your name and email to this address, you'll get on our email blast list, our mailing list for our newsletter and other email blasts that we send out, um, which would help you get information. It's IOD for Institute on Disabilities at temple.edu. Thank you so much. You have a fan here. Lucy Prawl wants to say hi to you. <laughs> hi, Lucy. It's nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, can you repeat the IOD? Um, oh, there it is um, for some of our participants who couldn't um, hear it. IOD at temple.edu. Yeah, um, like an excellent source um, to get information. I think this is one of the reasons um, Disability Pride events are so important because um, one, I learned a lot of information, but two, now I, I know all the dates and the links and I can share them with my networks and my friends. So if each of us shares information with just one other person, we're building our network. Please do share the information. That's so very, very important. Does anyone have a question in the group or a comment? Feel free to unmute yourself and say hello and ask a question. There's so much information to um, keep in its separate silos. Um, it must be a challenge from time to time to keep all that information together. Well, I know that I put a lot into one presentation and I sort of apologize for that because I know it's a lot to take in. But at the same time, there's a lot going on with home and community-based services right now. So I think I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't let you know as much as I could. No, it's really wonderful. Um, uh, there was a question about um, support brokers. It says, when will there be a support broker training? 
Um, that's a very good question. So um, supports broker training or certification um, during COVID has went to all virtual. Um, some of you may know that Temple has a contract with the Office of Developmental Programs to provide that certification. Um, the next time we're planning to have a certification class will be in the fall. Um, we have not announced a date yet because we're waiting to see if we might be able to go back to in-person training or if we still have to keep it virtual. So um, if you sign up for that um, at the IOD website that I, or email address rather that I put in the chat, you'll get a notice the next time we um, have a training schedule. That's great. Another fan, Kathy Brill um, says, this is an excellent session and thank you, Jamie. Sure, hi, <laughs> Kathy. And I see Alexa there too. Nice to yeah. see you guys. <laughs> They're side by side on my screen. It's lovely. Um, uh, here's another comment. Um, don't know if there's a question, um, but let me read it and we'll figure it out. Consumers have been ex experiencing major concerns from MCOs cutting hours and getting hold of their SCs. Is there any support coming out in these areas for them? Okay, so I think what the questioner is asking here, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that those people who are on the Community Health Choices Waiver, so on the um, OLTL side of things, the Office of Long-Term Living, those folks are under what we call a managed care model, which means that they have to deal with an MCO. So, um, Gosh, the names of the three MCOs are escaping me right now. But if you're in this system, you know what I'm talking about and you know their names. And yes, we know that there has been um, an increase in folks seeing their hours cut uh, by these MCOs. Um, why? Because if you're asking me, it's because we're asking um, um, basically an insurance company, a managed care organization to make decisions about services that are not medical, that are about quality of life and independent living. And we probably shouldn't be doing that. But that said, we're, we're stuck with this system right now. So what can you do about it if that's happening to you? Um, you should go to your supports coordinator and you should complain would be number one. If that doesn't work, then you should consider contacting the Office of Long-Term Living, OLTL, and complaining there. They have monthly meetings, um, uh, like a managed care subcommittee meeting, and those are open to the public. So you can, um, get online or get on the phone and make your voice heard there uh, with your complaint about hours being cut. Great, thank you. I'm gonna ask if there are any other questions. If not, we can... Um, just um, say our goodbyes. I would like to say um, this is a perfect opportunity to practice um, your uh, giving your voice and comments at 12 o'clock. We are having a town hall where you can begin to advocate for yourself. So you can um, use it as your first practice session if you're, if you're new to advocating for yourself. And also it would be great to hear other people advocate for themselves. So if you're learning about ways to advocate for yourself, join us in our town hall at noon. I also um, would like to again, uh, thank Jamie for such an awesome presentation filled with so much brilliant information to, um, make independent living and life choices uh, for people with disabilities um, to engage and have adventures in the world. So I just, I just want to really thank you from the bottom of my heart, Jamie, for coming in and sharing your expertise.
Well, it's been my pleasure. And I want to thank again, Disability Pride for giving us the opportunity to share this information here today. And I look forward to hearing from many of you. Great. Um, if you need a link to the town hall, you can go to Disability Pride PA and go to our virtual PA events and just click the link and it will take you right to our town hall at noon. So thank you um, everyone for coming and participating and getting this information. Um, let's spread the word. Thank you so much, everyone.